Uh, so for the first session of the day, we will bring together local leaders from different regions of the country to share cultural connections to our coast and the importance of our heritage and culture in charting the way forward for managing natural resources. It's often those folks in the field and on the ground and in the water who best know how to protect the resources for all of their value and all of their benefits. There's nobody more appropriate to do that out of the U.S. Senate than Senator Carl Levin of Michigan. We had a great honor and a great opportunity last night to recognize Senator Levin for all of his work on behalf of the Great Lakes by um, presenting him with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation's Leadership Award at our Ocean Awards Gala. And, uh, and that's over a rich, a rich career supporting our Great Lakes. So thank you, Senator. A round of applause, please. And he's led the nation in the recognition of the Great Lakes as integral to the nation's fabric, economically, environmentally, historically, and of course, culturally, which we'll discuss this morning. His vision and leadership helped to establish the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena, Michigan. Alpena is a place that started more than 10 years ago in fierce opposition to the idea of a National Marine Sanctuary, and now, uh, now is characterized by enthusiastic embrace and, um, and support. They see more than 80,000 visitors a year at the Heritage Center there, and Alpena itself has become a top destination for the region and, uh, and that part of the country. And as you'll hear from the Senator, much more is in store for Alpena and Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, he, Senator Levin's also co-chair of the Great Lakes Task Force. And of course, outside the room, uh, most everybody knows the Senator for his chairmanship of the Armed Services Committee, where he ensures uh, readiness and, uh, and works on behalf of the uh, military and their families. Uh, his full bio is in the program, as you know, but uh, known for his commitment and focus on the merits of sound policies, working towards his ideals and his commitments, reaching across the aisle to bring in uh, members of the other party. Uh, there's no better statesman in the U.S. Senate than Senator Carl Levin, and, um, and we will miss him dearly uh, as uh, this is his last term in Congress, but we look forward to working with him in his retirement, uh, if his wife allows, uh, once he steps down and takes on a new capacity. With that, let me welcome Senator Carl Levin. Thank you, Senator. Jason, thanks so much uh, for the great introduction. It is almost uh, as long as my remarks. I'm just uh, simply here to greet you. I, uh, I won't ask how many of you were there last night. I could probably look around and see from your eyes as to uh, how tired you are or other causes of whatever your eyes look like this morning. But it was a wonderful, wonderful event uh, last night. And the uh, foundation really is doing just terrific work, not just for, for our maritime world, but uh, really for the country. Uh, Alice Yates, who's, my, uh, who's on my staff, who does all my work in this area is also with uh, me this morning, and I want to just uh, kind of single her out for a special recognition. Many of you know her, but she just does a superb job uh, for the task force, our Great Lakes task force, and for me personally. So, Alice, why don't you stand up and give a little applause? Uh, the Great Lakes uh, truly define us, those of us who live uh, at the lakes, near the lakes. Uh, they are part of our DNA. Uh, it affects our, our lives in so many ways uh, that I won't even begin to try to enumerate them, but it's a very emotional thing for those of us who, who live in the lakes or at the lakes or near the lakes. Um, and um, I'll miss very much uh, not the lakes because I'm going home uh, on January 4th at noon, but um, uh, I uh, will miss uh, not being able to be part of the legislative effort, which is an ongoing effort to uh, preserve and to protect uh, these, uh, this fabulous resource of ours, which has been part of uh, the people who've lived uh, 
had her near the lakes uh, for 10,000 years when people first came to the lakes. As far as we can tell, the native people, it was very much a part of their story, very much a part of their uh, history, and very much a, a part of uh, what shaped them as part of their creation stories. And later on, when uh, the uh, immigrants came uh, to the lakes, uh, it had a huge uh, economic impact that made it possible for them to transport goods that uh, was part of their economy, it was part of their, uh, obviously, part of their diet. Um, and uh, one of the naturalists who wrote about uh, the lakes in 1838 uh, said the following. His name was uh, Francis de Castelnau, and he said that uh, about his travels on the Great Lakes, he said, we were a plaything on the uh, plaything of the giant waves. He said, I've seen storms of the channel, those of the ocean, the squalls off the banks of Newfoundland, those on the coast of America, and the hurricanes of the Gulf of Mexico. Nowhere, he said, have I witnessed the fury of the elements comparable to that found on this fresh water sea. Um, and so the sanctuary, which was created there over 10 years ago, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary uh, shows the graveyard of many of the ships uh, that uh, sank uh, in those storms. And the sanctuary, which uh, now has tremendous support, has uh, about 50 known shipwrecks already. There's an expansion which we're working very hard to achieve and which we expect will be announced uh, in September. We tried to do it by statute. The people very much support it, and the counties along Lake Huron uh, very much support the uh, extension of the sanctuary. It will be about nine times its current size in terms of square miles. We'll have over twice as many shipwrecks that we can identify already, uh, as is the case. Uh, but the uh, sanctuary uh, expansion, uh, we hope, uh, will be done uh, by regulation. We probably cannot get it done by statute, the, I won't have to describe to anybody in Washington or anyone in the country probably. It's kind of difficult to get things passed in the Senate these days. So we'll uh, work, uh, and the administration is working very hard to get this done by regulation. And so we hope in September that that expansion will be announced and will be celebrated. Um, by the way, Jeff Gray, who is the superintendent uh, of the sanctuary, was here earlier for Chow. There he is, Jeff. This is one spectacular human being, by the way. He is, uh, he, he is really amazing, and the people love him in Alpena. Sanctuary is very much a, a part of the kind of the warp and woof of uh, Northeast Michigan. Um, and Alpena, a small community on the lake, has just been burgeoning uh, since this uh, sanctuary came there. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be over 1,000 people coming there. Um, 600 or 800 students will be coming from all around the world to Alpena, um, as far away as uh, Hong Kong. And so it's had a wonderful economic uh, aspect, an educational aspect uh, is uh, something which is obviously we treasure, but there's a huge economic spin-off to the community. I understand that Jeff is also a member of the school board there, and I don't know how you took time off from the sanctuary to do that, but thank you for participating in our community in other ways uh, as well. So uh, one other thing I'll just comment on very briefly and then, uh, then I'll leave you and get to back to work. And that is that um, yesterday uh, the announcement came that the administration is gonna support very much the uh, renewal of uh, naming of sanctuaries uh, around uh, our country and around the coasts. Uh, be all the, the four coasts, uh, including the longest coastline, Great Lakes. Um, but uh, we're going to focus especially on the Great Lakes um, sanctuaries and to try to extend and increase the number of sanctuaries along the Great Lakes. Uh, the uh, Thunder Bay has been a tremendous success, but there are other areas in the Great Lakes which have a cultural and historical uh, importance to us that very much want to build on and use uh, the Thunder Bay experience for their own sanctuaries. So we will be uh, introducing in a, in a few uh, weeks uh, a Great Lakes uh, Maritime Heritage Assessment Act, 
which working with the announcement that you heard yesterday or some people heard from John Podesta, is going to be working with local communities, uh, identifying other underwater areas that are in the Great Lakes that uh, possess significant historical and archaeological resources and recommend the, coming from the grassroots that uh, these uh, areas be designated as national marine sanctuaries. And so uh, we're very, uh, very hopeful that uh, that is going to happen and uh, increase again the awareness not just of uh, this uh, precious resource that we're all aware of already, but the importance of it to our future, environmentally, of course, economically, of course, but historically, the lessons uh, to be learned from our history, which you also will be spending some time on today, are important to be learned. And hopefully uh, the uh, introduction uh, of that bill uh, which will lead to the naming, we hope, of additional sanctuaries and will contribute to the process that all of you are very much a part of. With that, I will again thank you for the great work. Thank you for your commitment uh, to our maritime resource uh, and uh, to all of you who uh, will be part of this story uh, for decades to come. Particularly, uh, I just want to kind of uh, take my hat off to you and tell you that uh, the tradition that you're a part of, uh, the stewardship that uh, you are a part of uh, is uh, really critical, I believe, not just to our oceans, uh, but also to our economy and to our very soul as a nation. Thanks again for all the great work you're doing. <clears throat> So thank you, Senator, and especially thank you for uh, continuing the leadership with the new bill that you and your staff are working on. It's a great compliment to, uh, to the announcement to have the White House and the opportunity to see new sanctuaries, particularly in the Great Lakes. A few reminders before we, um, well, actually, let me invite the next panel up now while uh, I go through a few logistics. I want to remind everybody to... Um, I'd like to remind everybody to use their question cards. So we'll have volunteers going up and down the aisles. Come on up, please. Uh, bring the question cards to the volunteers. Pass them down the rows. The moderator will go through the questions uh, during the discussion. Uh, for those viewing online through Oceans Live, please make sure you use the chat function and uh, the opportunity to pose questions to the moderator here. And, uh, and we will certainly look to take your questions. And, uh, and don't forget to use the uh, hashtag Chow2014 to keep the discussion going online. This next session will be moderated by Paula Johnson, curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. We're very honored to have her here with us this morning. Paula served as project director and co-curator of the exhibition On the Water, Stories from Maritime America. And uh, she currently oversees the, Mar the Marine Resources and Food History Collections at the museum. And so we, we couldn't have a better person to lead this discussion than Paula. Paula will in turn uh, and introduce the, uh, the remaining panelists. So thank you, Paula. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jason. And good morning, everybody. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here, to be part of this panel with such distinguished speakers. Um, this session, called Cultural Reflections on the Water, will look at the intersections between people and places, <coughs> cultures and communities, and the ways in which our history and lives have been shaped by the oceans, rivers, lakes, bays, upon which we all depend. Um, we'll explore distinct communities of people with deep connections to shorelines and coasts, and look at the nature of their relationships with the marine environment um, that have over time been tested, transformed, um, and in, in some form uh, sustained. As we travel with our extraordinary panel from Alaska to Hawaii to New York City to New Orleans, we'll hear about di how diverse groups of people are working to maintain their cultural traditions, communities, and identities in the face of environmental change and economic uncertainty. So to get started, I'll first introduce everyone. Uh, then we'll hear remarks from each speaker, after which we'll open it up for discussion. Our first speaker will be Chris Merkulioff, 
tribal president of the St. George Island Traditional Council in the Pribilof Island Archipelago in the Bering Sea. He's a commercial fisherman, vice chairman of the Aleutian Pribilof Islands Association, and member of the St. George Fishermen's Association. Raised on St. George Island, he, his wife, and three children uh, pursue a traditional lifestyle using modern technologies in fishing, research, and tribal business pursuits. An ind indigenous elder and statesman, President Merkulioff often represents his tribal and fishing constituents before federal, state, and native governing bodies. <coughs> uh, next, we'll hear from Timothy Bailey, a manager at Mon Mount Halakala, Haleakala. Haleakala, sorry, uh, National Park on Maui. Um, he is a recognized authority on the relationship between native Hawaiian natural resources and culture and has given numerous presentations on this at local schools, the University of, of Hawaii, at the uh, National Park Service, and many other educational venues. Um, he has worked since 1992 as a biological science technician for the, this national park and now serves as the manager for its aviation, fire, feral animal, and management program. He's an expert in living, working, and adapting to remote conditions and is a certified primary bird surveyor in Hawaiian forests. Our third speaker is Dr. Mary Kami, Director of the Wildlife Conservation Society's New York Seascape Program, which we'll hear all about. Um, launched in 2010 as the first uh, WCS Seascape in North America, this initiative seeks to raise public awareness and take action to conserve threatened marine wildlife through conservation, research, citizen science, and advocacy. Uh, Mary has worked in marine conservation uh, since receiving her PhD in ecology from Rutgers University. Um, and your professional efforts have focused on domestic and international conservation and management of large ocean fishes and sharks in particular. Very interesting. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Steve Matisse, Vice President for Coastal Protection and Restoration for AECOM. A native of Louisiana, he has more than 30 years of experience focused on ecosystem restoration and or hurricane protection in both the public and private sectors. Um, he has held many executive positions in the state of Louisiana, uh, Office of Coastal Protection and Restoration, Deputy Secretary for the Louisiana DNR, and Chief of the Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection and Restoration Act project of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Named Professional Conservationist of the Year by the Louisiana Wildlife Federation, and throughout his career has worked to foster trusting relationships between agencies, stakeholders, and the general public. Please join me in welcoming our panel. So let's begin with you. Okay, okay my name is. Uh, <clears throat> My name is uh, Chris McCulliff. I, uh, like I said, uh, the introduction shows um, I'm from St. George. Um, I think probably the, the first thing I would like to do uh, based on some of the questions and stuff that I've received prior in emails is um, just kind of envision um, going back to 1976. And not all of you can do that. I know that. Um, <laughs> there's only a few of us here, right? Um, <laughs> But uh, to go back to 1976, and uh, as a child, and eight, uh, being eight years old, uh, walking along the cliffs in St. George, um, no trees, all tundra, um, and looking down and seeing literally thousands of sea lions, thousands, not hundreds, thousands, from point to point, two, three mile gap. And uh, just being there and, and seeing the sun come up and breathe in the air, and then knowing that... Uh, I've got to walk another three miles to get back to the road. Um, come back to town and, and listen to the crested auklets that are chirping in the wind, and uh, literally thousands of them flying over like bees. Um, and uh, listen to the MERS uh, flutter overhead as they pass over the town, uh, which they do constantly every morning. Um, can be an annoyance if you, if you take it for granted and live there. Um, and, but most importantly, listen to seals barking in the rookeries uh, just a couple miles away from my house and knowing that when I open that door, I'm going to hear them. Um, and then all of a sudden, waking up in the morning and finding nothing. 
No sound. Just the wind. Waves crashing. Some of these are realities that are kind of scary to people uh, that live there. We don't, um, we don't want that to happen. There's protection measures that we can do. There's protection measures uh, that they can implement, and uh, going for a marine sanctuary is key. Um, we have applied uh, a couple different times on a number of different things. We have opposed a number of different things uh, from the tribe standpoint <clears throat> in regards to trawling and what, uh, whatever uh, heavy fishing uh, activities that are conducted out there. Um, we've applied for an MPA, uh, Marine Protected Area, and um, I obviously didn't get it, but the, the, the deal with that is, you know, I mean, uh, being stewards of, of not just of the ocean, but of an island in particular where, you know, we're looking for every protection measure that we can find <clears throat> is really key. And then being a commercial fisherman on top of it, um, on my boat, for example, commercial fishing, uh, it's all about protection of the fisheries that are around, all the fishes that are around you. We don't discard anything. Anything that's discarded, you know, is totally used for some, some other reason, bait, you know, and uh, subsistence take. Subsistence is key. Um, we, we, don't, uh, we don't overfish. We have a small quota, <clears throat> which has gotten much, much smaller in the past few years. And uh, be, because of, uh, you know, um, uh, agencies that are determining how much is, you're allowed to catch and stuff. Um, I won't elaborate too much on the fishing part of it, but the cultural aspect of the whole thing. Um, in the audience, I have, uh, I have my wife, her name is Sally, and um, she works right alongside with me. Uh, we also have another individual, her name is Michelle Ridgway, and I'm not sure where she went, but she's, she's one of our uh, sea experts, ocean experts, um, who does a lot of work with us. But um, as far as the cultural uh, aspect of, of the whole thing, you know, my, my wife and I work side by side. We run the tribal office, and uh, we, we do all the potlucks and subsistence foods and and uh, she's an alley dancer, um, a pretty good one too. And uh, <laughs> there's a group of about uh, six to eight of them, and they, they do alley dances for people that come to the island and, and stuff. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a really unique and uh, really interesting place. If you've never been there, uh, come on out there. Tickets are kind of expensive, but you know I think tickets are expensive everywhere, especially if you get here. Um, but um, you know the cultural experience and the, and the strength and the values that we keep to our heart and we portray to people that even people that come there um, is pretty strong. But, you know, to, um, to, to make it a marine sanctuary is really key, you know, and, and uh, moving in that direction is really important to us. I think that uh, I would be wrong to say that uh, we, we, we uh, simply just didn't care like, like some other, I've, I've listened to a lot of other people talk here the last couple of days and, and uh, I, I can see where a lot of the groups that are here really have a, a common interest, and that interest is to to try to preserve what we have, you know. And uh, we, uh, like with the students that we have, I have four students here that came from St. George. They've worked with uh, marine uh, sciences for the last few years. Uh, I always say they're scientists. Some of them talk to me every once in a while, and, and uh, you know, obviously I'm a commercial fisherman. I, I, I do some underwater uh, camera work. I, I take shots of videos and... and uh, uh, stuff of fish out there, but these kids are scientists, and they get to talk to me, and I get all confused after a while. I mean, <laughs> they, uh, they uh, uh, zooplankton and and all that other stuff, you know, and it all sounds good, and, and uh, you know, I think I understand a little bit of it, but they're really uh, the generation that we're we're trying to help, and and I got thanked the other day for bringing them down, and really the thanks is on on them for for giving me the the ability to want to uh, continue to strive to to do what we're doing. Um, it's a small population. There's only 80 people there. Uh, like I said, the quota is pretty small. Um, really friendly people, you're invited, all of you. Okay, let's get plane tickets. <laughs> we'll show you a good time. We'll do an alley dance for you too. I, unfortunately, we don't have all our alley dances. I wish they could be here today. I would like them to, to do that for you and uh, for, the, for all the rest of the panelists. Um, but, um, you know, there, there's other things that are that are involved in St. George too. I mean, uh, other things that are really interesting. Uh, they have some shipwrecks, shipwrecks. Um, uh, there's some village sites that are there. Um, we've collected, you know, through the years, artifacts and uh, a deep um, Russian Orthodox religion as well, uh, which is really important. I, I think that uh, probably the the basis for everything that we do, you know, everything that we we um, we are, and uh, 
I, um, it's home. And, and I miss it right now because a couple of weeks I'm supposed to be fishing. Um, but uh, I elected to come to this because I, I thought that the importance was uh, really strong. Thank you. Great. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, come on. <laughs> uh, aloha. Good morning, everybody. Um, before we get started, uh, Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council has a, a brief video, and I was told to give the sign and cue it up. So Here you go. we'll cue that up real quick. They were supposed to queue it up. <laughs> <laughs> one million square miles, one third of the Earth's surface, larger than all of Earth's land area combined. Seafaring cultures have survived for millennia on small, isolated islands in this ocean. The U.S. Pacific Islands comprise about 1.5 million square miles and account for half of the United States' exclusive economic zone. Today, the accumulated impacts of Western colonization exacerbated by the impacts of climate change are threatening the natural resources upon which the native cultures rely. Calling the Pacific home are the indigenous Pacific Islanders of the state of Hawaii and the U.S. territories of American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, each with her own traditions and practices while sharing a common bond. So uh, that was the voice of uh, our executive director, Kitty Simon. If you guys don't know her, she's wearing a, a lei in honor of uh, what I'm about to take you guys on, a little, a little mythical journey here, um, which is more my style. So I enjoy this conversation type uh, setting. As you can tell, I'm probably the most conservative looking one up here on the panel. <laughs> and I'm a little overdressed, so I apologize. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I thought I'd, I'd go ahead and, and give you guys a little history and background, and, and maybe we have a bone to pick um, about Rhode Island being the ocean state, because uh, <laughs> you guys know Hawaii is a 50th state, right? So <laughs> there's an ocean around us. Just thought I'd share that. <clears throat> so today marks a unique day for our Hawaiian people. Um, some families embrace this day. Others simply choose not to acknowledge it. But today, June 11th, 2014, uh, I personally have a strong genealogical tie to this day. Um, so my tattoos are cultural, not criminal. <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic that I stand here on this non-state slash federal district of the United States <laughs> because today back home in Hawaii marks the day that a native Hawaiian was raised in a natural fiber loincloth who fought with ancient weapons and strategies, who farmed and fished, and who became known as Kamehameha the Great, as you can see uh, on our slide. It has meaning here today, too, for Kamehameha greets everybody in the capital, the visitor's capital, capital. And the photo you see is basically how we try to live in today's world by walking in the footsteps of our ancestors to help provide solutions for today's problems. Paea Kamehameha, he had a responsibility that was placed upon him on birth. And as Kanaka Maoli or Hawaiians, we have that responsibility. He had to live out a plan that was willed to him by the gods and what was observed to him through his eyes. Yet not, will, not everyone will agree what he did but the tasks that were given to him were fulfilled, and his sovereign land still exists today. You see, our lands were thriving, our natural resources were fertile, our people were cultivating, and our islands were changing. 
as Kitty pointed out, Western influence was strong. Their presence was overwhelming. Our ancient ways were diminishing and our people were dying. The introduction of non-native species began to prey on our endemic and indigenous resources. And adaptation to this new ecosystem was beyond our reach. Our kapu, or taboo systems, and beliefs were removed so that our once loyal people to our gods could now get the medicines of Western sickness and save themselves. So this this brief introduction that I wanted to share with you of our Kalahui o Hawaii. And I now join in this global discussion about climate change, its effects. You see, our ancestors, despite any controversy of scientific history, they came to our native home. Some say we migrated. Others say we came from a kalo plant or a taro root. And some understand that there was a catastrophic natural phenomenon that may have brought us to our islands. I'll leave all these theories up to you, but it's very important to understand that a tool was given to us, Kanaka, today, passed on through our ancestors. And it's a simple chant. Well, maybe not so simple. It's 2,000 verses. <laughs> but it's called the Kumulipo. The Kumulipo was a tool that had inventoried the resources. It inventoried our gods, our lands, our waters, our oceans, our people, our history, and our creation. And yes, it even talks about climate change. For our Kumulipo, our chant, is only of great use to you if your daily life relies on it. And it relies on those resources that we have listed. It's a tool used in the past. It's a tool that we use today. And it should be a tool that can be used in the future. One fascinating part of our Kumulipo is the relationship between the land and the ocean. For every resource listed on land, it is a guardian or parent of the resources listed in the ocean. Put simply, what happens on land will affect the ocean, and what affects the ocean shall affect the land. Therefore, we probably should manage both the same way. Let's see if I can advance this here. So, the EEV bird is the guardian or the parent of the Hinalea EEV fish. So what's on land will guard what's in the ocean. And you guys can see the commonality there. A lot of people like to look at the science, and I agree with you. There's a lot of words that we can't pronounce when we, we look at it scientifically. But we do know that this is simply put as Hawaiian science, which is common sense, common sense use. So now that we had this tool in place, it was a system that was needed. I'm going to back up. For this tool was known as the Ahamoku system. It was another ancient system that was created to manage the land and ocean resources to ensure these resources produced to its fullest and that the people would adapt accordingly, especially when climate did not allow for that full production. The Ahamoku system did not counter against nature, nor did it try to set protocols for nature, because nature knows no protocols. So it's really up to us to be able to adapt to these changes. Now please don't interpret me by saying we just watched and see what happens. For our ancestors did not create this system to just stand by. This system was to ensure that adaptation meant to manage according to nature. To observe nature and recognize that nature in itself is a tool. To watch the ground nesting birds that leave our islands once a year or to see the golden plover from Alaska to return. To recognize the flowering of certain plants on land would mean that the seaweeds and the limpets would be abundant. To have seasonal closures during the time when nature, quite frankly, took its course. As we observe nature, the unwritten codes of conduct were passed on orally. These were codes of conduct based on events that evolved the moon phases, the winds, the rains, the currents, etc. You see, codes of conduct taught to us at birth were based solely on nature. So the distortion of our ways today, cell phone, computer, technology, etc. Not that I'm saying these are bad, 
as we sit here with a PowerPoint. <laughs> but it has aided in the disconnection to nature by drifting us away from the simple fact that we, as humans, are nature too. When we look to those cultures like my culture that choose, despite odds against us, to stay connected with our natural resources that, again, are found only here in Hawaii, endemic and indigenous, it is these resources that have given us our culture. It defines our people. Because we are so connected and rely on these resources, climate change affects us more than others. We embrace with nature every day of our lives. And that is why we, the native cultures, need to be in this global discussion on climate change. We are given time to speak, our voice is heard, but it's not equally carried like the voice of science. That's just wrong. We have the generational link, answers, and techniques to appropriately adapt to climate change. But are the people today ready to take the sacrifices that it'll make to make these changes? I will leave one thought before we get into our discussion. And it was about a comment yesterday that I heard. Communities are starting to forward their concerns on the effects of climate change. Maybe because the ice is changing or rivers are growing, the fish and the game is farther away. Why? Is it the fear of this natural climate change? Or is it because some of our concepts that we have been forced upon to stay put, to build permanent infrastructure, which therefore has removed the native instinctive ability to move and adapt? So walking in the footsteps of our ancestors, literally. So thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation this morning. And in the words of Pa'ea Kamehameha, he said, no man is greater than the Kalo or our tower root himself, which simply says, remember that nature is first and we are second. Mahalo. I'm Mary Cam. I am with the Wildlife Conservation Society. I direct the New York Seascape Program. And I think I'm going to be taking a 180 degree turn almost <laughs> from probably our discussion about some of the most remote places and, uh, and rural places in the world to absolutely one of the most urbanized ecosystems, marine, ecos exist e marine ecosystems on the planet. Um, New York City has had a very long, deep, and uh, maybe a conflicted relationship with the ocean. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm also going to be focusing more on the wildlife as well and a little bit less on cultural uh, connections, although you'll see that, that has, our cultural roots really tie us very closely to the sea. But before I get started, I want to just introduce you a little bit to the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, we have been based in New York City since 1895 and uh, are known probably mostly for the five, or, wildlife parks that we operate there. We have four zoos, including our flagship, the Bronx Zoo, as well as the New York Aquarium based in, in Coney Island, which you see up there. Although the picture that you see is not the way the aquarium looks right now. It's what the aquarium will look in about two years when we open a new exhibit called the uh, Ocean Wonders Sharks. Now, the aquarium took a pretty big hit during uh, Hurricane Sandy. We're only a few hundred feet behind the Coney Island Beach. Um, and so we are beginning to rebuild uh, that, but this, this exhibit actually was uh, planned long before uh, Sandy. What a lot of people don't know about what WCS is that we also are very much a field-based conservation organization. We do site-based conservation in about 60 countries around the world, and a 30, about 30, 23 of them we have marine programs. Uh, we employ about 170 PhDs and veterinarians and their staff to do this, uh, to do this work. And in, if you look at the, bl uh, the blue dots, you'll see that a lot of these, we work in some of the most remote um, and uh, beautiful and uh, biodiverse locations in the world. So, in two th so the question is then, why do we have a New York Seascape program? I mean, you couldn't be almost more opposite from that. We're right. We're one of the most disturbed, possibly marine ecosystems on the planet. But uh, after being in New York for 130 years, WCS decided that it was time to actually do marine conservation in its own backyard. And so, in 2010, the uh, new uh, the 
um, New York Seascape program uh, was, was initiated. And our focus is primarily on protecting wildlife, their habitat and habitats in New York, and trying to raise the awareness of marine conservation in, 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 a, in a culture that is really much focused on a million other things. And so we, we have a pretty big challenge ahead of us, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit to you about that um, now, today. So the New York Seascape program basically encompasses the New York Bight and the Long Island Sound. Um, uh, so it's not just New York waters, although I'll sp talk to you a little bit more uh, today about just New York City as a, uh, as a, and its maritime routes. If you look in the upper uh, corner, left-hand corner of this image, what you're going to see is a, 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 a recreation of what New York City or Manhattan Island actually looked like in 1609, or what we think it looked like when Henry Hudson came into the, into the New York Harbor. Uh, this was created by WCS's uh, Dr. Eric Sanderson, a uh, landscape ecologist, uh, trying to help us visualize what our roots are, what, what it looked like back then. At the time, uh, the uh, Lenape uh, tribe was uh, very had been established here already for millennia, and there were coyote, there were mountain lions, wolves, black bear, elks, river uh, river otter, all roaming the streets of of New York. Now that's an, an image of uh, the past that we obviously are not going to try to recreate, but it does give us sort of a foundation from where we've come from. Now, fast forward 400 years, and you can see some of these other views. These are, these are images that I think most people around the world, and even New Yorkers, kind of can think, when they think of New York City, that's what they think of. Uh, a place that has very much a uh, very urbanized and economic center, uh, a, 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 an arts and culture mecca, um, but not necessarily a vibrant marine uh, community. But I would like to, us to think about a new vision for New York City. We are a city of islands, an archipelago. We are surrounded by water. We have more coastline, I think, about 500 miles. I think that's more than Cape Cod. And yet nobody really, most people I know, don't really think of us as a maritime city with deep maritime roots. Um, most New Yorkers really have turned their backs. They're looking inward and, and into the concrete jungle of New York. And, and it's, it's, if we're going to try to build, as a part of my mission, to build a marine constituency there, we're, gonna, we're vying for a lot of, uh, we're competing with a lot of other issues and a lot of other demands on people's attention. So that's part of our, our, our goal and our mission, is to try to connect people back to these maritime routes. And here is another vision of, of New York that very few people ever see. You only have to paddle or swim 15 miles off to 10 miles even <clears throat> outside that most urban center. And, and you are in this, what I sometimes call a wilderness, right? Now, it isn't actually a wilderness in the, in this, in the sense of the, the Wilderness Act. We know that it obviously has been uh, very much altered by things like pollution. There's a lot of human presence in the system. But this air, this, this, these waters are, pro, are very wild, really wild. And if you think about what's happened, the transformation that's taken place in New York City, in, in, in Manhattan, in the terrestrial environment where virtually all the megafauna has disappeared, this is a very different world out here, just off our shores. And nobody really in New York actually, not nobody, but a lot of people just do not realize that we still have globally significant populations of some of the most important wildlife. Uh, some of the, we have the largest. We have some of the fastest. We have some of the most ancient wildlife in our waters. Last week, we were doing a, co uh, a presentation in Coney Island for World Oceans Day at, at the aquarium. And we were telling uh, kids and their parents that we have 26 species of sharks in our water, or the largest mammal on the planet sings just beyond the walls of the aquarium, the blue whale. Um, that we have, a, we have a, a, a canyon, the Hudson Canyon, that is the size of the Grand Canyon. That it is, it, that it, mar it marvels. It's, it's just as majestic. Very few people, unless you're a recre fish, recreational fisherman, know that. And so, what we're trying to do, as as wildlife conservation site and a program I work on, is to try to make people aware of these ecological treasures that really are right in their own backyard. And partly as a result of that, the fact that there is so little awareness. 
we suffer from having a lack of marine protected areas. Uh, we do have a few, there is a tilefish area that's protected. There's a long line closure that's seasonal. But we have no real, we don't have very few marine protected areas and we have no national marine sanctuary. And after yesterday's uh, great announcement, I'm really hoping that we are gonna be able to change that because not only do we have phenomenal ecological diversity and resources, we have thousands of shipwrecks, a thousand off of our coast. And so there's a lot of cultural resources there as well. Now, New York City has, been, has had a wave of immigrants coming forever, for going back, uh, you know, the Lenape have been there for probably many, many millennia. Um, and then in six, to, six 400 years ago, Europeans started coming through. And originally, maybe they were coming because of their interest in, they were seeking religious freedom. But there, were, there was a drive for wildlife. Uh, the recognition that wildlife was just amazing there drew a lot more people. So we don't have a lot of historical records from the period, but what we do have suggests that they were encountering things like uh, oysters that were 12 inches long. Um, lobsters, 12, six feet long. There were sturgeon that were so dense and so, so, so populous that it was hazardous to actually work, to maneuver in our, in our rivers, um, and we call, they were called Albany beef. That's how, that's how common they were. Um, the fast forward now to today, we've lost a lot of, we have not lost many species, but we certainly have depleted our, 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 our ecosystems. And so we have a shifting baseline situation where it's really hard. Many things have declined a lot, and we're trying to recognize, to get people to understand that if they appreciated these, this wildlife and committed to it, that we actually can restore a lot of these populations. Uh, New York City, the, the, our population has grown astronomically. We now, in the, in the, count, in the, in the coastal counties along New York's, uh, in, in the tri-state area, account for 7% of the U.S. population on only a half, less than a half percent, a third of a percent of the land mass. So we are, we are the, one of the most densely populated coastlines in the, probably in the world. And so uh, trying to you know, get people to focus on that is, you know, to, to, to get attention of these millions of people, even a small percentage of them, to think about this amazing seascape that we have in the wildlife would be phenomenal. We're not only cultural, and, and part of that growth is highly culturally uh, uh, diverse as well. In New York, in Brooklyn alone, 136 languages are spoken. So we have a very, very uh, diverse human population as well as in our waters. It's also economically important, waters. Um, New York is still one of the most important port cities. We've developed that way over the last 400 years because we could transport resources. We have a phenomenal harbor that's only going to grow in importance as we vie for some of the new big ships that are going to uh, uh, the mega ships with the opening of the Panama Canal, and now we're looking at wind energy development offshore. So wildlife is competing with a lot of different uh, impacts. And we're, our job is to try to make sure that these, these waters are safe for wildlife. Um, we, New York City, or, I'm sorry, Manhattan is the most important county in the country for employment in the marine sector, number one. And partly because we have a very large population. But it's probably, we have also a very important port and uh, marine construction uh, accounts for a lot of those jobs. So balancing the needs of wildlife against a lot of our economic and cultural uh, um, um, is issues is, is a challenge for us. I'm sorry, this is not the clearest picture. Uh, this came off my daughter's cell phone. Um, the, uh, the other night, we went to a Broadway play. Uh, we got to see uh, Daniel Radcliffe, and if you, who many of you may know as Harry Potter. And even after being, uh, watching him on the stage, hundreds of people lined up outside the theater just to see him and get his autograph. And it just occurred to me standing there that if we could just get a few of those, a, a, a small segment of the, of the population who is really connected to all of the other phenomenal resources in New York City, city to turn around and look at the sea and understand that we have, we have natural resources that are equally valuable, important, and we've depended on forever. It would be just phenomenal. So what we need is 
more of this. We want to, I want to capture some of those people and turn them into those who are going to be really excited about building a national marine sanctuary in our backyard, protecting our wildlife, and, 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 and making sure that it's vibrant, not along, along with our cultural and economic resources, but our, our wildlife resources for many generations to come. And so as one, as one colleague said to me, uh, John Waldman, who's been eloquently writing about the, the values of, of, uh, and resources of New York City for, for a couple of decades, he basically said, if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere. And so that's our challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Steve Matisse, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about my, my most favorite place in the world is my home, uh, coastal Louisiana. And um, do what? Just give him a second. Oh, okay. Um, first off, I think for you, for you to be able to understand what coastal Louisiana is all about. I want to tell you a little bit about how it was formed because that's what drives our main problem, which is coastal land loss. And I'll tell you about why Louisiana and coastal Louisiana should be important to you. Okay? First off, if you think about the United States, the Mississippi River system is the largest naturally navigable river system in the entire world. And a lot of people will attribute that major fact to you know, our, our economic development as a nation historically. Okay, so if you think about the funnel that you're looking at here, okay, it drains all our parts of 41 states, two Canadian provinces, and all of that water exits to the Gulf of Mexico through New Orleans. Okay, that's real important to understand because if you think about coastal Louisiana, and what I have here is an image of coastal Louisiana, and you see all the different delta lobes that were formed by the Mississippi River. And that's really important because when the river empties into the Gulf, those sediments are deposited, and over time it builds up sediment. And what happens is that sediment is trying to become rock, so it's constantly compacting. Okay? When you build up a delta lobe, it, when the river finds a shorter route to the Gulf, it'll, it'll form another, another lobe. Okay? So that, that growth pattern is what grew all of coastal Louisiana. That's a very fragile system. That has only happened over the past 7,000 years. So we start out sort of in a, this crisis mode. Okay? Then what, then what happened was, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, um, then what happened after 1927, we levied the river and we stopped that process. But when I think about, for you guys, why should you care about that, I'll tell you about why Louisiana is important to the nation and why it's important to your checkbook, okay? So first off, in coastal Louisiana, we've only got about 2 million people. Uh, maritime jobs account for 300,000 jobs, oil and gas, you know, we've got $70 billion annually of oil and gas activities in Louisiana. That, that employs over 300,000 people as well. Okay, those are big numbers. But let's talk a little bit about just if you think about the inland waterway system in the United States. Okay, the, the width of this red line talks about the, the tonnage of <coughs> freight that is moved, commodities that are moved. And you can see the, ma the major majority of that is from the Mississippi River. If you look at the Mississippi River, and especially in Louisiana, you probably didn't know that the Mississippi River between Baton Rouge and the Gulf of Mexico is the largest port complex by tonnage in the entire world. Okay, that means everything that happens in the central part of the United States, for it to get to foreign markets, it's got to go down the Mississippi and out the mouth of the river. Okay, and you do realize that the very mouth of the river it usually sediment, sedimentation is it's silting in all the time, and we, it costs about um, fifty million dollars a year to keep the mouth of the river dredged. And if you don't have money to do that, and you have to narrow that channel, that means ships can't get out. Okay, which affects all of us and affects everybody in here. Your pocketbook. Fisheries. If you look at all the fisheries landings in the United States, you look at coastal Louisiana. Louisiana is by far the top producer of fisheries in the lower uh, county of the United States. And then oil and gas. If you think about oil and gas, did you know that Louisiana is the top producer of domestic oil and gas in the country? Not Texas, not Oklahoma, Louisiana. And offshore Louisiana, the royalties that are generated uh, offshore Louisiana contributes more to, the, to our federal treasury um, through oil and gas resources than anything other than the IRS. This is what offshore Louisiana looks like. 
This is oil and gas production offshore Louisiana and the network of pipelines that come on shore. And I'll just tell you that that oil and gas that's produced, that doesn't power things just in Louisiana. That powers our, our national economy, okay? That's what happens in Louisiana. The first oil well was drilled in Louisiana in 1901. When you're looking at this map, you think about, you know, what I showed you about where the deltas were developed, <coughs> where the Mississippi River is. Think about oil and gas and think about fisheries. It happens on the same piece of real estate. Now, culturally, you guys have heard about Cajuns, right? Well, you probably think Cajuns are just French, right? I mean, you think about 400 years ago, French go to Nova Scotia, they work with the Native Americans uh, or the, uh, the Natives, they, they figure out how to live on the coastline, agriculture, fisheries, and then about 1750, they get kicked out because they wouldn't pledge allegiance to England and they wouldn't renounce their Catholic faith. They wander around for a couple of years and then they find this remote area of the world that's so inhospitable, no one wants to live there and it's coastal Louisiana. So they can be left alone, right? You can live in this bounty and no one's gonna, no one's gonna mess with you. So they move to coastal Louisiana. But if I told you that we in Louisiana, Cajuns are not just French. I mean, it is, we have this melting pot of, you know, Italian, German, Islanos, which are Canary Islanders, Yugoslavs, Croatians. The Croatians taught us the oyster, how to, how to do the oyster industry. Filipinos, Vietnamese, Latin Americans. We're, Cajuns are not just one thing, okay? Cajuns, what, what you do is you look at it and you say, one thing that we all have in common is that we're tied to the land. And for generations, our families have worked in fisheries. They have worked in navigation. They have worked for the oil and gas, okay? So we're tied to the land probably like no one else. Now, the problem of today, if you look at the same piece of real estate, the map that I'm showing you is, is, is how much land we're gonna lose in the foreseeable future. Okay, think about the people that live there. And when you see those little straight lines on the map, that means we have a levee there. Okay, so we, we're constantly battling. If you say, do people really realize the impacts of climate change? I'm gonna tell you, in my hometown where I live, we understand it and have understood it for a long time now because our houses get flooded, okay? Uh, the land goes away. Areas that we saw as a ch child that were solid land are now open water. And what happens when you no longer have those contiguous wetlands in place? What's one of the things that could happen? As a kid who lived through Hurricane Betsy in 1963 and then lived through Hurricane Katrina, I'm telling you, if you remove 30 miles of contiguous wetlands and you have the same hurricane surge, you have dramatically different impacts. People in here forget, you hear about, you hear about Hurricane Katrina, which will be nine years ago in August, but people forget that three weeks later, there was Hurricane Rita that took out the western side of Louisiana. You forget that when that happened and you shut down oil and gas production in the Gulf of Mexico, that gasoline prices at the pump in your hometown went up 75 cents a gallon. You forget that. Things that happen in the Gulf are important to you. Now, I, again, I, I'm a guy from New Orleans, okay? So if I had a pointer, I'll show you where I live in New Orleans there. I live on the old historic ridge, which is close to the river. My house didn't flood. But if you look at this map, this is the depth of flooding in New Orleans. Okay, we had areas that had 10 and 12 feet. I'm also gonna tell you that when that happens to you, your, your communities change, okay? We have, we have a community that's a, a little bit south of New Orleans in St. Bernard Parish, which were primarily Croatians, okay? And I'm talking about historically generations, but when you have cities by the name of Wyklosky, that doesn't sound Louisiana and Cajun, you know what I mean? We had communities that were so devastated that the community as a whole moved. Your grandparents, your parents, your brothers and sisters, you moved, and you moved in mass to the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain. And you did it at the same time, so much so that you could move to that community, rebuild your Catholic high school, and populate it with only your kids from your neighborhood. 
okay? Because it was really important to that community that they remain, that they maintain their cultural heritage. I grew up on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. You know, I don't talk funny, right? I don't sound like a Cajun, right? Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, when, when, when those, you know, the folks in St. Bernard, when they move to St. Tammany Parish, both cultures are going to be changed. Probably, I'm not sure whether it's better or not. I mean, I, I, I really, I, I like the, the, the separateness of coastal Louisiana uh, and all of our communities. So that's the crisis that we face. And hopefully in the question and answer, we can talk a little bit about what it takes for us to come to common ground. Because if, if I told you, I showed you the problem, you can imagine when we talk about what potential solutions are, and you talk about large-scale diversions of Mississippi River water into those communities to rebuild the wetlands, that changes isohalines, it changes uh, fishing patterns, it changes the impact for flooding, all those kinds of communities, all those kinds of problems. So you have people that oppose it, but you say you should, you should support it, right? Because it's rebuilding wetlands and that's a long-term benefit. But if we've learned anything, uh, it really is be careful how you, how you look at communities. Because for any of us in this room, uh, I gotta tell you, if, if they came to you or your parents and said, you know what? We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take real positive actions and it's gonna destroy your livelihood. But you know what? You, you, and we destroy your livelihood you can't pay for your kid's college. You don't have a retirement. But, but society is going to benefit. Thank you very much. <laughs> How are you feeling about that? Probably not too good about it. So we need to figure out ways that when we, when we propose these large-scale so solutions in my neck of the woods, that everyone understands the benefits and we don't leave people out. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for just wonderful comments. Um, we have a lot to cover, um, but the, um, the strands um, kind of fall into uh, a few topic areas, a few themes, and we've had great response from our, our wonderful uh, group here that actually nicely dovetail with some of the questions that, that we had brainstormed um, among ourselves. Um, Essentially, from the audience is knowledge and to, to Timothy Bailey is knowledge and practice of traditional management structures still robust, or are they threatened to extinction by Western influence, loss of cultural sovereignty? And a corollary is um, how can traditional ecological knowledge be integrated into resource management practices to prepare communities for change? Well, in today's world, we, I've I've managed to be involved with the legislative process in trying to take something so sacred to us as natives and put it in a legislative process. Um, and the first step we had to do was go out and inventory what's there. Uh, I know we used the term yesterday as stakeholders. Um, first time I've ever been to Vegas, so I think of stakeholders as gamblers or in somebody of interest. but. Um, <laughs> We look at stewardship uh, as a key. So in an island, we, we get impacted because we have no place to go. It's small. There's no place to go. And those islands that are uh, washing away, so to speak, in the southern Pacific, they're coming to our islands. And the impacts are greater. But I think we have to go out and inventory because a lot of our history has been lost. A lot of our knowledge has been lost. And a lot of it has been um, hopefully not offending anyone, contaminated with a little of the Western uh, concepts. So we're rebirthing these things by re revitalizing our culture. But to stay connected, we have to have those natural resources. And it, it is a huge challenge. And not all Hawaiians think the way I might have proposed things. And that's just one story. But uh, I think if, if we look at stewardship and the first stewards and incorporate those ideas equally with science, then we just have two better tools to, to go ahead with this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question really has to do with, or many of the questions have to do with communication. Um, the, I think we recognize the, the value, the cultural value in these communities, in these places, um, and among so many people. 
but we live in a very diverse country, um, and it's very hard to be heard. Um, and especially if um, people are not familiar with um, the Pribilof Islands, with Hawaii. Um, and so one of the questions is about effective communication. Uh, how can we effectively communicate uh, the cultural and traditional importance of the marine areas, the resources, and the cultural traditions, both to uh, the general public um, and in particular to younger generations uh, who may not really have a clue yet. Mm. And that's a question, I think, for everybody. Chris? Um, <clears throat> well, I think, you know, uh, give you an example. Um, you know, I mean, we, I mean, we have brochures that have a lot of information on them. Uh, definitely uh, getting uh, websites, uh, building uh, uh, sites for information on the island which is really key, you know. Uh, one time, um, I don't know, a couple, of three years ago, maybe more than that, but uh, <clears throat> I decided that I, mean, I was on a trip, uh, a business trip, and uh, happened to be in Vegas, Vegas. Um, but um, I took a whole box of brochures and I just left them on the table. I asked the hotel to do it and they said, sure, you know. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, a few months later, I've got, you know, a whole bunch of phone calls about St. George. Oh, I'd like to visit there and all these other things. So. I mean, uh, the communication side is really actually the easy stuff, especially on the web. I mean, you can you can get on the web and talk to the world nowadays, and, mm -hmm. and uh, still, you know, uh, and and be able to uh, maximize that. But then, how do you uh, translate that into making a case for policy change, or for um, you know support? Um, when you write a proposal. Um, to, to like a you know federal agency, you you, you want to try to put as much culture in there. They, they they don't really look at that. I mean, I, I not, no offense, but I mean I, I've written letters before where, you know, I've given them that uh, you know this is deep cultural, you know, rooted and uh, we we this is how we live and and you know they just don't capture that. So I, I it's kind of a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little tough. Well, one of the things that um, in yesterday we were t the one of the panels was talking about the importance of the science of data points for um, communicating what needs to be done, and you know, cultural value is just very hard to quantify and to make into data points or any metric. Um, so, are there particular cultural expressions, particular, you know, whether it uh, artwork, um, um, you know, I don't actually know, but. You know, are there cultural expressions that you have found that resonate not only among your your own communities but with a larger public? Yes. Um, well, we have we have a regional nonprofit that that does a lot of that too. You know, and and as far as St. George goes, I mean, uh, if if anybody were were to come to St. George, they would already understand it's the first seal island. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and. You know that there's value people there. The, the, one of the things that, like I said, I, I go back to the web-based stuff. But as far as uh, being able to capture that, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day experiences. Uh, the, for example, like um, you go to Louisiana and uh, visit people down there. You go down uh, uh, Bourbon Street and you grab a lot of the what what goes on there. Not necessarily the culture, and and uh, not necessarily the the uh, Cajun side of the whole thing. You got different different people there. Could portray different things. I guess you you just have to be there. You have to live there. You have to come to them visit the island in order to understand a lot of that. It's not something you can just, you know, grab overnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. I I think globally and everything we look at, it has to be site specific. And mm -hmm. you know what faces, I, I went to Louisiana and worked with the oil spill. They called me in all the way from Hawaii. Um, our job was to go and train people how to catch the oil pelicans from the helicopter. So I spent some time down there and saw the, the impacts and learned about what had happened during that area. But it's definitely a different approach. Um, when I went there, I looked at what they call elephant ears, and I said, hey, that's taro. That's what we have back at home. So there are similarities, in fact, Walking the streets here, I saw a smilax that looked and mirrored just like the mylele I gave to Kitty. So there are definitely commonalities that we have. 
but the management side of things and the incorporating of traditional values have to be site specific. Mm -hmm. And if you can lock into the generational knowledge that we have, and we're rebirthing it because we have interest in that resource because it identifies us, it feeds us. We have to incorporate those things. Um, what, what scares, and I'm not going to speak for all our Native people, but what scares um, us a little bit is kind of an easy management of just saying stop and preserve. And then we suffer because not only that, if we want to care for that fishing grounds, we have to have interest into it. And the example I would give is I'm a farmer, but I'm a terrible farmer because I work for the National Park Service. So if I don't feel like watering my crops that day and going out into the barn for the night, I just became a terrible farmer versus when you're forced to have to you know, continually um, provide and, and manage and use and put back and back and forth. So I think it, it has to be site specific and everybody has different cultural values and viewpoints towards that. Thank you. Mary. So as I mentioned, in New York, there are so many things vying for people's attention. And so how do we get them to think about you know, the resources that are out there, ecological resources, and how do we build stewardship for them? And so I, I'm fortunate that I work for an aquarium, so I have people coming to us. We have, you know, people want to come to the aquarium to learn about things. And you know, this week, we got them to come because of the bubble guppies you know, uh, they, that tr attracted them. But once they are, they're a captive audience. So we can talk to them about some of these things. Uh, but, but I think also we want to look for alternative ways um, in, in a place like New York, where we have a lot of our economy also dependent on the, on the waters, working with other industries that are uh, very much dependent on healthy ecosystems, I think, is, is, is key. And trying to build those partnerships, I think, is going to be a, a, a good way forward. But New York is a cultural mecca. And so we're trying to think about all, uh, ways to tap into that and use the ex people's understanding or need for, um, uh, 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 for, for the arts. Um, it's hard to ask people to protect things that they don't know or they can't see. And so what we have decided to do is try to actually um, get images of wildlife in the water. So there is no photo library that exists right now of all the wildlife in its natural habitat in New York waters. And as I've tried to explain to you, it's, it's quite rich. So, so like if you were at the gala last night and you saw Brian Scarry's images, it, it, those are very compelling. And it's a great way for us to try to connect people to, to these resources. So we're trying to do a photo catalog and exhibitions that will get people excited in a very artistic, in a very artistic way. But another project that we're doing that re re connects to our cultural roots and looks at a dependency on marine resources going way back is we're undertaking a 400-year retrospective of marine fisheries and fauna in New York. So what role has fishing had in terms of changing the ecological nature and, uh, of wildlife in our waters? And in addition to looking at how landings have changed over time and the shifting baseline, the, the, re the fact that we're recognizing that Generation after generation, we actually overfish our, speed, our, our waters, and we forget that, and we overfish them again the next generation. We're looking at those landings. But the other part of the project that's really exciting and fun, and a great way we're hoping to connect to food-savvy New Yorkers, is that we've analyzed about 12 or 1,300 uh, restaurant menus. And I'm working with a great cultural ecologist, um, uh, historical ecologist, Carolyn Hall, to help do that. And, and looking at these menus going all the way back to the 1870s, we have an idea of what have we been eating in New York, how are we dependent on uh, the wildlife in our waters for food, you know, and how has that changed to over time, and how has what we're eating affected the fisheries, and what, what, how the fisheries affected what's available on the menus. And so that's a, another way to reach uh, a, a new audiences, we hope. So when um, these people get their consciousness raised, then what do you want them to do? What is, what would action and support. I want them to support a national marine sanctuary in the Mid-Atlantic. Okay. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the things. I also, we want them, you know, we want them to be, engage them in stewardship, so to be able to speak on behalf of wildlife. If there was a way, it's very difficult to get people uh, to, to th out to like fishery management council meetings where decisions are being made day in and day out on the, on, on the future of these resources. And if you don't have an invested stake, you're often not there. It's, it, that's very challenging. So trying to educate people about the process and engage them in that would be a, you know, what, an, another avenue that we would try to, that we would hope to work on. Steve, I want to ask you the communication question and messaging question, but um, I also want you to talk about 
um, all the diverse communities that you mentioned, um, making up you know the 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 Creole culture that we know of as as New Orleans, as New Orleans, at, in addition to taking a message, a coherent message out. Well, and and realize, I mean, it's it's no secret. I mean, people people get passionate about things that they care about. You know, if they don't care about something, they're not going to invest a lot of time in it. Okay, and I'll go back to the problem in Louisiana. It's it's not that it's not. We don't have anyone that doesn't understand the coastal land loss problem, okay? And I'll tell you, it was a little bit different before Hurricane Katrina. Before Katrina, we could kind of talk about it from a hypothetical standpoint, what would happen if we had a major storm. It was another thing that when, it, when the storm happened, now how do we respond? Everybody's lives were changed. People relocated. People left the state. Um, and now it's a, it's a, it's continually on our, uh, on the front burner as far as the way we think. Like you would be surprised that we're in hurricane season now in, in, in Louisiana, started June 1st. And when we watch our local news at night, the first story is about what are the storm systems, systems coming off of Africa, okay? Because that's how in tune we are because literally our lives can be destroyed. So, you know, that's the kind of the crisis we have now culturally, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that, that we really discouraged our Native American heritage in Louisiana. We, dis we discouraged the Cajun heritage. Uh, you could not speak French. Um, you were punished if you did, okay? So, so now that's just coming back and we're beginning to take a lot of pride in who we are as a people. Even those of us that are, that are probably not, uh, you know, a registered Cajun, uh, you know, a, uh, like myself, although I grew up on the North Shore, and Matisse is a is actually a German name, and that's how they pronounce it. My family's been there for generations, um, so I, it, it's that messaging of of what's important to us, and for us, it is maintaining the land mass in place the way it is because the land mass provides protection from storms. It supports all of the, the natural resources that make us special, fisheries. It supports oil and gas, it supports navigation, it supports all of our jobs and all of our neighbors. So we try to make that connection. Now, I'll, I will tell you that when I was an NEP director in Louisiana a long time ago, the, the thing we learned, and, and I, I'm not a communications guy, okay? I, I'm a biologist that worked for the Corps of Engineers. All the good and bad of that, okay? I, I thought I knew that the questions and all the answers, okay? Which I was really wrong about that. But um, the one thing that we learned really quickly was that if you wanted to make a change 10 years from now, what you did was start in grammar school today, okay? Now, I was an EDP director in 1990. So, you know, we jumped 25 years forward and it's like that, okay? Those kids that were involved in those first education programs now vote, now have jobs. And now they are putting pressure on the whole system mm -hmm. to, we need to do something about saving the landmass. But now it's personally important to me. It's my family, it's my job, it's my life, it's my grandmother, it's my grandfather. We need to do something now. So I would say, and that, but that's a long-term kind of thing. You gotta look at it 20 years into the future. What's the change you wanna make? But if you start with kids, and I think anybody who's a parent knows that even if it's something you don't support, when your second grader comes home and says, you know, this is the way it's got to be, why do you leave the water running when you brush your teeth, you know, whatever, you kind of guilt you in there and say, oh, okay, I'll make changes, okay? And that's where I think it, you know, that's really a lesson for us. So pre preserving the land mass, um, it does that also include allowing people to rebuild on the same places that have been so affected? Well, it, and it, we have, a, we have kind of an issue, like, you know, people think about wetlands, right? And if you're anywhere else in the country and you talk about preserving wetlands, uh, if, if you want to preserve wetlands in Maryland, you just move 20 feet up the slope and you build, you build your house and you do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can come to Louisiana and I can fly you from the Mississippi state border to the Texas border. You can look out of the window of a helicopter and never see an area that's not a wetland, okay? So if we have a working coast, we have to figure out how to live within that working coast. And uh, be perfectly honest, historically, we've always looked at structural flood protection being the way to pr protect us from storms, build a big levee. 
uh, that didn't work out too well in New Orleans uh, with Katrina. So now we're looking at other methods of how do you live uh, in place, elevate ha homes, those types of things that, that provide you the ability to still live where you want to live, but then weather those storms without total devastation. Um, a question from the audience um, about the um, marine sanctuaries. Um, what do you do um, when there is uh, pushback for having marine protection um, in your communities, since maybe everyone may not agree on that approach? I think Hawaii think leads that process <laughs> in anybody. Um, it, I think when we look at data collection, it gets one-sided mm -hmm. and it's always the viewpoint of that person collecting the data that kind of pushes the agenda of how things are going. Agencies need to collaborate mm -hmm. and look at the responsibility of what they have. Um, and uh, maybe there's just not enough communication on the agency level. I mean, I, I know because I've worked for the National Park Service for 24 years. I'm not here representing the Park Service. But their agency has different you know, values and mission statements than Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council, Whale Sanctuary, NOAA, all these things. But the idea is, I still think, when you have resistance, you have to include, I, let's back up. I think you have to go in, list your stakeholders, define them, and then prioritize where you're going to be with them. And then go site specific and see if that stakeholder is a stakeholder or a steward. Mm -hmm. And when you define these things and inventory it, you'll be able to, to work collaboratively with the, with the cultures and the communities and all that and, and balance. Things have to be in balance. Um, and that's w one reason my tattoos on my left side and our right side is we, we have a balance. We have, a, we have to keep things in balance. And I think the agencies have to do that as well. But once you start that process, once you engage stakeholders, you can't ever stop. I mean, that's one thing that sometimes you see people will go, how many times you go to a public meeting and, oh, yeah, yeah, I have this report that's coming out tomorrow, I need your input, but, and then, yeah. and then they're, you're gone. They never engage you again. And when you start that, you, you need to have a mechanism to ensure those people that if they give input, their input is respected, and it's, you can maintain that, that engagement long term. Chris, do you have um, complete agreement about the uh, marine sanctuary program that you're hoping for in the Pribilof Islands? <clears throat> well, we'd like to get it established, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier, you know, what do you do? I don't know, cry. <clears throat> we, I don't, I don't know. We're, we're not that. We're not there yet. I mean, we we just uh, started. Uh, we we're, we're trying to uh, we're trying to get into the process and become a part of the marine sanctuary. We very much want to do that. Um, I, 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 I don't know if I, I, I would uh, answer that properly because we're not there yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair enough. Well, we are about out of time. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, this has just been a, a wonderful uh, journey through very complicated um, issues in beautiful and important places in the United States. Uh, please join me in thanking them. So let me thank in turn Paula for moderating a wonderful panel. You mentioned it's a tremendous journey, but uh, I want to note again, uh, as you all know, that that's very much in the, in the real sense, given that we have Alaska, Hawaii, uh, the Gulf, and, uh, and the Big Apple uh, all represented here in this panel. So it's a journey in many ways for this panel. Thank you all very much. Uh, we'll take a half hour break. We'll reconvene at 11 o'clock. Uh, for those of you who are interested in lunch, haven't bought lunch tickets yet, please go back to registration. You'll be able to buy them for, uh, for later. Thank you. <laughs>